Hello, everybody. I think that um, you all hear me. So um, if you hear me, just um, just type something on on the chat or just switch off uh, quickly your microphone and just say that you hear me. I can hear you. OK, thank you very much. So I, uh, uh, I can hear you from Niger. OK, fantastic. So I would like to welcome you all, and um, it's great that um, you uh, managed to participate to the webinar. So I hope that all of you are fine, and um, we wanted to uh, take advantage of um, this particular time uh, where we maybe have more time to uh, dig into uh, some uh, additional knowledge. So. Um, I wanted to talk about a little bit on uh, more understanding of IoT device architecture and the whole ecosystem. So a lot of you may have heard about Internet of Things and um, you may know approximately what it means. And here we want to go beyond that. We want to go in more technical detail, but uh, don't be afraid. We're not going to very technical detail, but what I want to do is to make a survey on what are the technical issues that are challenging or the most uh, um, particular to uh, the Internet of Things. So um, this course uh, can be, uh, this course can be found in, um, sorry. So this is found in the uh, online courses. So it's part of the uh, it's part of the uh, fundamentals course on, on IoT. And um, so let's start a little bit. And uh, before I start, um, since it's it's not the usual face-to-face uh, -face courses, uh, I, I believe it, it can be a bit difficult uh, to ask questions during the um, during the talk. Uh, we will have a, a, a session question. Uh, at the end, uh, but well, if, if you really think that there's something that you 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 you're not understanding and and you miss something, then it's okay, uh, just in, in, interrupt me, and then I, I will try to 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 answer your question. So um, if everybody is ready, so let's start the um, the webinar on on Internet of Things. So um, when when you're googling for Internet of Things, um, you're going to see a lot of um, lot of communicating devices, lot of links, lot of materials. And uh, the most commonly found images you will, you will find is a lot of things talking each other, communicating uh, by the so-called internet. And the image is uh, that you are adding communication facilities to objects things that normally don't have communication uh, facilities. So, um, of course, uh, you do have several levels of what we call Internet of Things. So you have what we call the home consumer Internet of Things with home uh, appliance, household appliance. So here in these pictures, you see a person, uh, a scale, a weight scale. Uh, connected to a smartphone to monitor the, the evolution of the weight. So this is something that uh, can be considered as uh, home consumer IoT products. And before I, 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 I go uh, into the technical detail, um, just to, to, to emphasize on the tight interaction the Internet of Things has with the physical world because it is at the core of what we call IoT to be able to sense the physical world. So um, at the very bottom of these IoT devices, you do have what we call the physical sensors. So if you do have temperature uh, devices, if you don't have range devices, if you have GPS, or a smartphone and so on. So uh, underlying you have the physical sensors that will allow you or allow the, 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 the commuting objects to interact with the physical 
world. So you do have uh, temperature sensors, you do have rain sensors. Uh, these examples show, for instance, a smart bin container being able to sense the amount or the distance from the top of the bin to the uh, trash so that you can estimate um, how much you, you may have to think about the next step. If you know the, the, how the bin is filled, then you can organize uh, a little bit more uh, efficiently um, the, the collection of the, of the trash by, 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 the, by the people who are going to collect the trash. So you, you, you also have GPS uh, sensors and you have accelerometers and whatever, okay? So there's a tight link between uh, what we call Internet of Things and the, the physical world. Um, of course, um, when we're talking about Internet of Things, local interaction is possible. So in this example and in many uh, home appliance examples, um, the, the, the connectivity of choice uh, is choosing, you may know about it. I mean, you, you may use Bluetooth also. It's a short range communicating devices. And the advantage of Bluetooth is you can find it in any smartphone. It's uh, somehow low power. I'm going, I'm, I'm going back to that a little bit later regarding the, the, the power issue. Somehow low power and it's very convenient because it uh, can be used to connect a, a lot of uh, devices because it, it has been a communication. But uh, we all know, we all realize right now that the main advantage behind uh, so-called Internet of Things is when all this data that will be collected by all these things will be pushed on Internet clouds so that we create new interactions uh, with all these uh, multiple data streams. Okay, so this, this, this slide shows, for instance, the number of uh, so-called Internet of Things devices pushing data to clouds and interactions on these clouds can be realized in some manner. So um, we can sketch out uh, we can sketch out um, the general public IoT architectures by plugging uh, the uh, so-called Internet of Things devices on top of uh, what can be found in uh, most of uh, um, most of uh, uh, most of internet connectivity found at home so you may have some kind of smart devices and then then you may have some kind of wi-fi access with a dsl box so could be dsl or maybe your smart wi-fi and then you Pushing data to some, some, some social media clouds here on smartphone or tablet. So architectures, um, like the, uh, the the internet is not stable. Um, do you still hear me? Yeah, sometimes your voice goes. Yes, yes. So sometimes there is some problems with connection, but it's okay. Okay. Uh, so I see that we have 50 participants. So maybe uh, that's the um, maybe that's one of of the issue. Okay. So uh, let's continue. Um, of course, uh, you do have um, the the uh, regular internet clouds and most of you probably know Dropbox, Google Drive and social media like Twitter, Instagram and Facebook and so on. Uh, of course you can use this cloud but um, I believe that you, you all know that a, a, an internet of things, a communicating object is not a person. So we're not going to exchange a tweet or we're not going to exchange uh, videos or whatever uh, between the uh, so-called uh, communicating, so-called communicating objects. 
So there are clouds that are uh, specialized for Internet of Things. The way they are specialized is because an object may, uh, let's, let's take the example of a temperature object, a temperature sensor. So what you want to push on the cloud is just a temperature. And maybe you are going to push the temperature of a room every 10 minutes so that you can the uh, historical evolution of the room. So IoT oriented uh, usually have visualization tools. And uh, when you go into that IoT oriented cloud, then it will be very easy to, for you to track all the data that you have sent to these clouds. And a lot of these clouds are quite powerful with very advanced visualization tools. And uh, if you want to connect your IoT device to this cloud, you definitely have access to a large number of uh, very easy visualization tools, allowing you to take uh, advantage very quickly of the data that uh, you are sending to these clouds. Uh, excuse me? Yeah. I have, a I have a question here. Yeah. So, uh, for my understanding, all these platforms are just for prototyping. Um, today, uh, what is my level of confidence on these platforms when I come to have uh, an, end, uh, an end product? So can I trust these platforms? Uh, can I give access to my, for example, abonnee or something like that to, to, have, to have access to this data? Or should I use them only for prototyping and then for my final product, do my own a cloud platform. Okay. What do you think? Um, okay. Uh, this platform. Are so, sorry, far... uh, most Mustafa speaking. Huh? Sorry. Just. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw it. Um, these platforms are far from being just for prototyping because they are. They do have a level of maturity. They do have a level of security that are quite high, and a lot of these. Uh, a lot of these cloud clouds, the, the free access, the free access policy, where you can have limited data and you have limited features. So you can use them for prototyping. But then if you want to have a normal version, then you, you usually they, they are based on some kind of a monthly or annual subscription. And they, they really provide uh, very nice features. But also, of course, you do have uh, open source clouds, free clouds that you can also, also install on your own server if you want to build your own cloud server exactly. for your customers. So yeah. everything is possible. But to answer to your question, uh, these clouds are quite professional. So you can trust them. For me, you can trust them because everything is in, in mm -hmm. encrypted. And uh, you, you, you can have several access and you can create several accounts for, for your customers. But of course, if you want to have access to this uh, advanced functionality, then uh, it's, it's, a paid, uh, it's a paid policy. But uh, okay. Okay. It, it's okay. I mean, a lot of these clouds are, are, very, are very professional. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. So, um, if we, if we try to summarize all these things uh, all together right now, um, the main goal of Internet of Things is to, uh, let's say, smart uh, ecosystems, where at the very bottom of the architectures, you do have these sensing devices for a number of applications, could be irrigation, livestock, aquaculture, logistics, water, water quality, agriculture, farming, and whatever. And then the goal is, of course, um, to uh, have the collection of data. So this is what we call the uplink. And then you will have the data analysis, optimization control. And eventually, you will have the uh, back link, the actuation, so the downlink, in order to act on the environment itself. So uh, if we take a very simple example regarding irrigation, so if you send that the, the soil is too, is too uh, dry, then you will analyze whether it is really dry regarding the 
plant, the soil, and the crop types that you have on your field. It's too dry, then you will open the water valves. So this is uh, some kind, of some very uh, simple example just to illustrate the monitor, optimize, and control um, ecosystem that the Internet of Things wants to build. Now. Um, of course, it's one of the most promising markets. So on the slides, you can see a lot of Internet of Things devices. And a lot of them are very mature. They're on the market for years. So uh, it's, uh, it's a, I mean, the, the Internet of Things ecosystem is, uh, at the same time, uh, it's very mature. But still, there's a lot of things to do in this ecosystem. So. Uh, this is why there's still a lot of companies or still a lot of startups jumping into that ecosystem. Still room for innovation. A lot of um, research and effort is, is, is also devoted to IT or development, so building countries or hot areas where uh, the old technology is still very low and where some Internet of Things devices apply appropriately to these uh, applications can bring a lot of uh, benefits. So irrigation, as I said, livestock farming, fishing, and so on. Um, there's a lot of things in agriculture also. and. Um, don't think that uh, smart agriculture is something new. It has been around for more than 25 years. And in, in the next slide, you will see a lot of these devices already uh, designed and sold by companies uh, with long history in smart agriculture. So uh, it doesn't mean that, again, there's nothing to be done on, on that uh, side. But it means that you already jump into a very uh, mature market, very low cost, but still efficient, uh, efficient, uh, system, then it, there's still room for some innovation here. So uh, now let's, let's, let's go into the, um, the, the, the technical issue that I, I, want, to, I want to show you. Um, remember this, this picture, this nice picture showing the uplink and the downlink. So one of the first issues I want to, to, to talk with you right now is these arrows uh, of course, uh, the core of the Internet of Things, being able to collect data from the application up to the control system. So uh, the problem is, is it, it is not that easy to do so. And you probably know that um, we are not going to, to link them with wire, okay? So we are going to use wireless transmission. So you all know about wireless transmission. You all know about um, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and all this, I mean, 3G, 4G, these are wireless transmission. I just want to uh, review very quickly the uh, underlying uh, properties or underlying um, concept behind wireless uh, transmission. The concept is very simple, actually. Uh, if you have a, a, a metallic, uh, a, a metal, um, material like uh, uh, then if you apply some kind of a voltage then you will have an electromagnetic wave described in green and this electromagnetic waves depends or is directly linked to the variation of the voltage here so if you apply something like a sinusoidal variation of the voltage then you will have a sinusoidal variation of your electromagnetic field. So if you manage or if you make this variation periodic according to a given frequency, then at the end, your electromagnetic field is going to vary accordingly. So it will show also some kind of frequency, okay? So this is used in communication because if you assume, for instance, that you can send zero with a given frequency, 
and then you can send one with a given frequency. Then if you make the variation of the voltage, variation of the electromagnetic will be able to wirelessly your digital information, okay? Because at the other end, if you have the reception antenna here, then it will pick up the variation of the electromagnetic field and then will reproduce at the other side the variation of the voltage. So you can deduce, you can determine the frequency of the signal and then you can map this frequency into digital one or digital zero. Okay, so this is a very basic of wireless transmission technologies. One of the problems we have in Internet of Things is how costly is it is to send the information. So I just want to uh, to I just want to make clear. Sorry, I just want to make clear with you that it is not difficult to have a lot of bandwidth high throughput using wireless link, okay? It is not difficult at all. We are doing that for years. We can have gigab gigabytes of uh, throughput using wireless link with satellite or with laser or with traditional uh, wireless links. The, 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 the only issue is how much power are you going to inject into the transmission, okay? So if you inject a lot of power, you can have a lot of bandwidth and you can travel very far, okay? So distance and bandwidth is not really a problem in wireless transmission. It is not the limiting factors. The limiting factors is how much energy it's going to cost you. If you look at this table here, 2G, 3G or Wi-Fi, then you can see the amount of energy in transmission that you need. 500 milliamps or almost 1000 milliamps for 3G here. What does it mean? It means that if you have a device trying to access the uh, wireless networks and it's going to sleep most of the time, okay? So you have the, 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 the consumption in sleep mode, very low consumption and once every hour, it's going to wake up, wake up for eight seconds. And during these eight seconds, it's going to uh, try to capture something from the physical world, could be temperature, could be something else, connect to the 2G, 3G, 4G networks, send the data to some kind of internet clouds, okay? So this is the uh, typical behavior of uh, what we call an internet of things devices. If we try to uh, compute the um, transmission power, the mean consumption on one hour, then the equation is quite, you have eight seconds time the consumption, and then all the rest of the time, it's going to be in sleep mode, and then you divide it by 1.11 milliamp per hour, okay? So now if you link that with the capacity of traditional uh, AA battery, the capacity is not the voltage, okay? So it does not depend on how many, uh, on, on, on how many battery you, you are using. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you multiply the number of, of batteries, then you, you, you increase the voltage, but you're not really increasing the capacity in terms of current. So if you take the, the, the average capacity of these batteries, and then you divide it by the, the, the mean consumption, then you have approximately the number of days your device is going to be able to operate. And obviously here, you can see that 93 days is not enough. 93 days is about three months. So if you're going to talk with one of your customers that it has to change the battery every three months, it's not going to be attractable for him, okay? You, you, you have to target at least two, three or five years of operation to be able to attract customers in deploying Internet of Things. So as you can see here, it's, uh, it's really a matter of uh, how much energy you can spend in transmitting your data. 
So if you look at the um, uh, wireless technology space, you have here the data rate, and here you have the range. So of course, you know, some of these technologies, Wi-Fi, for instance, 3G, 4G, for instance, which has high data rate and long range, okay? And you have the short range technologies, Bluetooth, for instance, is a short range, meaning that the range is, 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 is very low, but then the data rate is somehow in between with Wi-Fi and uh, a little bit less than Wi-Fi. And then it, you see that there's a space here that is being left uh, unused for many years. And this, this space here represents the very low throughput, but high long range, okay? And obviously the, 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 the longer distance you want to cover, the more energy you're going to consume, okay? So the idea here is to have a radio technology that allows you to have very low throughput while still being able to transmit on a long range, okay? And that's the core of the uh, transmission issue we have in Internet of Things. Because these things, they don't need a high bandwidth. You're not going to, to stream videos, okay? You just need to send temperature from, from, from time to time. So you don't need high throughput. But you need to be able to do that on a very long range, like 5, 10, 20 kilometers, in order to be able to reach some gateway that will be able to send your data to Internet servers. So um, recently, there are the so-called low power wide area networks, the LP1, and they are promising technologies, 5G technologies with narrowband IoT, Sigfox technologies, LoRa technologies. All these new technologies are, 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 are used in Internet of Things because they offer the connectivity uh, uh, profile that is adapted to these Internet of Things devices. So uh, let's have a look at these technologies. The goal is to be able to transmit far, so several kilometers, but see, compared to the consumption of the other technologies, we're now talking about something between 18 milliamps and 40 milliamps. So let's try to make the computation again. Let's take 40 milliamps as mean. So the mean consumption in one hour is, I can shorten the time when I'm awake here because this kind of technology doesn't need a connection mode. So you don't need to negotiate anything with your operator. You just wake up and you, 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 you just send. So instead of, of having to, to, to to wake up for eight, you can shorten your time to two seconds here. So you're consuming 400 milliamp between two seconds and then the rest of the time you're in sleep mode. So we ended up with a much smaller energy consumption per hour, okay? And if we still take the capacity of the, of the regular batteries and we divide it by the mean consumption, then see that we greatly increase the lifetime of our internet devices. So we, we go from three months to something like 10 years. Of course, the 10 years is a bit optimistic because um, this battery, if you put it outdoor, um, the energy will be, uh, will be, I mean, the amount of energy will disappear due to climatic environmental conditions, cold, hot, and so on. But we can, we can expect more than two years of consumptions. And, and we do have Internet of Things devices in our office that has been working full time for more than two, three years without any problem. So uh, what is the expected range we can have with this technology? So it is represented here a little bit for Sigfox, LoRa, narrowband IoT here. So blue, red, and, 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 and green. And we can see that actually uh, we can expect much more than the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or the short-range connectivity uh, solutions. 
So Sig Fox is the best. We can expect like 40 kilometers in rural. Laura, we can expect like 20 kilometers in rural. And narrow band IoT can expect something like 10 kilometers in rural areas. So rural, there's no high buildings. Mostly you have what we call line of sight with few obstacles, but it means that you don't have the very dense building that will uh, will uh, create lots of lots of lots of attenuation. So talking about attenuation, um, when you transmit a, a signal, an electromagnetic signal, it's going to attenuate, and this is the general equation showing the transmitted power. Okay, so let's assume that you transmit at two watt, for instance, so which is quite high, and then you have the distance. And then you have the, the, the power you will receive at the receivers, okay? So you see that the equation is, 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 very, is very simple. And the distance here is power value here, and it's alpha. Alpha can be two to four. So it means that the attenuation increases very quickly with distance, okay? Now, uh, if you take an antenna and you can compute the, the ratio between what you are transmitting, the power you are using for transmitting and the power you are using at the, you are receiving at the receivers. And the formula is quite simple as you see. I mean, there's a lot of uh, things that you know 4p is a constant, you have the distance here, you have the frequency here, and then you have the speed of light. So what you can see from this very simple equation is two things. The ratio between the transmitted power and the received power depends on the distance. And that is something that is quite obvious, okay? But it depends on the frequency also. So it means that the higher frequency that you are using, okay, the higher frequency that you're using, meaning that PE over PR is high. And if PE over PR is high, it means that PR is very small, okay? So it means that the attenuation is higher if you're using higher frequency. So this is why a lot of long range radio technologies, they are using a low frequency signal and not the high frequency. So what do I, what does it mean high? Wi-Fi for instance is 2.4 gigahertz. It's already high frequency, okay? Most of the low power radios are working below the gigahertz uh, frequency. So it can be 800 megahertz, could be 400 megahertz. And obviously if you're using 400 megahertz, you have less attenuation than if you're using 800 megahertz because of this formula here, okay? So um, it's also very simple from this, from this uh, equation to compute the uh, attenuation using a lower algorithmic scale, what we call the decibel dB. So the advantage of using decibel is you can transform multiplication or division by uh, multiplication. I mean, when you have the power here, you transform multipli uh, multiplication by, by, by addition. So this, this very simple formula can be expressed like this, 20 log of 4 PD on, on lambda. And if you use the frequency version, then you have this version. And you can see that you can extract the frequency here. You can extract the distance and you have a constant here. And this constant represents the constant, the 4P over, over C constant here. So we ended up with a very simple frequency, a very simple equation that managed to express the attenuation we have. So um, what's the advantage of this equation? The advantage is that we are going to be able to express what we call the Let me explain a little bit this, this slide. Everything is in green is the gain. 
So the power transmission is a gain. Everything in yellow is the attenuation, it's the loss, okay? So you transmit at the given power, you have the amplifier, and then due to the distance, due to the electronic equipment and due to the distance, you are decreasing the power of your signal. And at the receiver, you can have some amplifier circuit to amplify the signal. And at the end, you ended up with a receiving power, okay? So you start with that kind of power at transmission, and at the other end, you ended up with this level of transmission power following the attune calculated by the previous slide, okay? So uh, one important uh, criterion here is what we call the receiver sensitivity. And it shows that how well a receiver can decode the signal. And if you manage to have a very high sensitivity at the receiver, it means that you can support much higher attenuation. And since this attenuation depends mainly on the distance following this equation here, if you, is, if you are able to cope with higher attenuation, then it means that you can increase the distance of your transmission, okay? So this is how most of the long range uh, transmission systems are working by having a very high receiver sensibility here that would allow the support of much higher attenuation. And in this case, then you can increase the distance of your of your communication system, okay? So how can we increase range? There's two ways. You can increase the transmission power, like speak louder, or improve the receiver sensibility, okay? And uh, it's very difficult to increase transmission power because of the reason I show you. I mean, if you have an IoT device running on batteries, then if you increase the transmission power, it means that you're going to decrease the lifetime. You're going to decrease how long it can run on batteries, okay? So we still want to have very small transmit power. So if we want, if we cannot really act on this, then we have to act on this. We have to try to improve receiver sensibility. How can we do that? Well, it's quite easy and it's quite very similar to what we can do in, in our daily life. If you want somebody to be able to understand you easily, then you have to speak slower, okay? For instance, if I'm talking very fast, then maybe I would not heard the conversation very well and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to understand it very clearly. But if I speak it, if I speak very slower, slowly, then I can increase. For instance, I can say, hello, or I can say, hello, or even more slower, I can spell every letter. I can say H, E, L, L, O. And then you can see that the, the, the slower I speak, then the, 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 the better the understanding at the other end, even if you have noises, okay? So that's the, that's the advantage of uh, talking slower. So uh, LoRa, which is one of the um, uh, recent IoT radio technology, it typically do that. It will increase the transmission time, okay? It will use what we call these spreading factors, okay? Higher spreading factors means longer transmission time. The cost is the throughput is very small. Nothing to do with Wi-Fi access or 4G access. See, it's 200 bit per second. I'm not talking about megabit per second. I'm talking about bit per second. So 200 bit per second, up to 37 kilobit per second only, okay? So if I want to go very far because I need long distance, like 20 kilometers, then I have to increase the transmission time because I'm going to speak much slower and then I will be able to increase the receiver sensibility, but at the cost of a much 
smaller footprint. But this is the main issues behind Internet of Things. It's always a trade-off between the amount of power you want to inject into your system, the lifetime you want to have in your system, and then the distance that you will be able to cover uh, still maintaining uh, enough power at the receivers to be able to decode your signal. Okay, so I hope that um, um, I, I try to make uh, it clear. I hope that you, you understood the main challenges regarding the, the transmission here. And um, I'm going to pass this, this slide. And if you're talking, if we're talking about uh, these new radio technologies, then there's a bunch of, of, of small radio modules that you can buy on the market, as you see. I mean, there's a large variety of, um, of, um, of, radio, of radio modules. And we're, we're going to come back to, to this a little bit later when we're going to discuss about the IoT hardware. Uh, one thing that I, I, I just want you to, to uh, add is uh, a lot of people think that uh, when we say uh, a clear transmission, like a line of sight transmission, a lot of person think that if two antenna, if you draw a straight line between this antenna and this antenna, and if there's nothing in between, then you have what we call a clear path, a line of sight. It's not that true, actually. In every wireless transmission, you have what we call the Fresnel zone. It's like a football, American football uh, uh, shape like this, okay? And you have three zones, zone one, zone two, and zone three. And it's acceptable if a large part of this zone are free without obstacle. But if you do have obstacles in this zone, then you do have attenuation. You do have a lot of attenuation. So it means that you're not really in line of sight. So what are we doing in order to free this zone? Usually we can elevate the antenna. So if you have one antenna much higher, then as you can see, it's much better because you have this zone that is covered by vegetation, of course, but Imagine if you have the second antenna at this level, then you have all this zone that would be occluded, okay? So this is why in most wireless transmission technologies, you want to raise at least one antenna, okay? Of course, if you can raise both antenna, it's even better, but sometimes it's just impossible to raise both antenna, okay? Because raising one antenna, it's easy. This can be the antenna of your mobile operator is going to choose high level, high scale buildings. So it's easy for them to put antenna on top of the buildings, okay? But you, if you're walking on the street, okay, you will be in this situation. You have your smartphone here, so it's quite low. And then you're talking is a higher antenna. So you manage to free most of the frenal zone, okay? So you manage to make the transmission a little bit better than when you have the second antenna below at the surface level, okay? So the, the notion of Fresnel zone is, is important to keep in mind because the general idea is even if you, if you, it seems to be in line of sight, where if you have vegetation, if you have buildings somewhere in this Fresnel zone, that it's, it thin mean that you're creating some kind of interferences or, or attenuation. Okay, uh, now um, let's move to um, the second issue. So the, the first issue, if, if, if you remember, is the, um, the wireless um, transmission. Now that I, I explain uh, some part of this, let's move to the um, IoT hardware. What we mean by IoT device is uh, you have some kind of sensors. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, yeah. question here about the first issue uh, do you want us to ask question uh, here or after you finish your presentation you um, well that's okay uh, i think that you can ask me right now okay uh, we are speaking about a uh, uh, different way of communication speaking about LoRa, about sigfox about narrowband iot and uh, uh, one of the most important criteria of the iot is the cost Okay. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, for some African countries, we don't have uh, 
any support for Sigfox or Laura. Uh, is it for you? What what do you advise for a product? Uh, should we should we go to Laura and create a private network and then with Gateway go to 3G, 4G, and something like that, or uh, wait for a Sigfox or something to come to this country, or wait for Narrowband? Because in my opinion, Narrowband. Uh, update will be very easy uh, compared to Sigfox having new BTS, new base station, and new installation by the operators. Uh, what do you advise here for someone who wants to choose between this uh, different way of communication? Okay, uh, yeah, this is a very interesting question because uh, it it is uh, typically something that uh, is real issues in Africa. Um, Sick folks, my, 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 um, going to come in, in, uh, until soon. And maybe if, uh, I, I'm not sure best in sick folks now, the market is, 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 is small. So, uh, right now, if, uh, if we want to deploy something, uh, LoRa is suitable. And this is what we are using in, in many projects in Africa. Because okay. you, can, you, can build, um, you can build your own network. Your own you network. To run a LoRa networks. Yeah, yeah, you, you can have your own LoRa network. And, and it, yeah, yeah, fits, yeah. it fits very well the needs of uh, small holders, small exploitation farms, and small applications in Africa. But of course, um, the business model is going to evolve and Africa is changing very fast. So I expect mm -hmm. that when Narubin IoT will be rolled out uh, in, 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 in very dense manner, let's say in four, five, six years in Africa, you probably will have Narubin IoT technologies out there uh, run yes. by operators because it's not going to be very costly for them to add the Narubin IoT technologies exactly. on top exactly. of the uh, 5G technologies. So yes. I, I think that right now, LoRa is good in Africa, but uh, in, in, in a couple of years, you will have Narubin IoT taking uh, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, uh, a, a lot, a big pieces, big pieces of the market. So you may, you may consider at that time switching to Narubin IoT if this is needed. Or you can stay with your own private LoRa if it works. Okay. So Excellent. this is my opinion. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. I have a question. I have a question, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. So I have to ask yeah, if sure. uh, this is a very, very, very regulation issue when we need to implement our own LoRa, uh, for, uh, I can say, network. Uh, yeah. Can we have to ask uh, to the regulator uh, before uh, before installing it? Yes. Um, usually, these these radio technologies um, they they are using what we call the uh, unlicensed band. Unlicensed means that you don't have to uh, you don't have to pay or you don't have to uh, to ask uh, for for permission. Yes, not but, in only African countries. Uh, for for uh, unfortunately, for example, yes. some. Uh, because it's 68 right. megahertz, you need to have an authorization from uh, Ministry of Defense and something like that to be able to to install some equipment uh, working with this kind of frequency, either uh, either 868, 868 or 915 or 433. All this frequency need some authorization. It depends on the country on which you are today. Yes. Sorry. Yes, I, I was going to say that because officially officially uh, africa belongs to zone one regarding the uh, itu uh, itu geographical area they sign uh, the agreement on the unlicensed ban but most of african countries they have local uh, regulations that supersede the international regulations because they have given some of the band to mobile operators. And this is typically the case with 800 bands. Uh, even if they agree that 868 bands belongs to the unlicensed band, they uh, actually sold some of these frequencies to mobile operators. 
So it means that in Africa, uh, the, the, the situation is a bit more complex. If you want to roll out mm -hmm. LoRa network in the unlicensed band, the so-called officially unlicensed band, you really have to uh, get in touch with the national frequency regulators so that uh, you uh, can ask them what is the frequency that are really free in the country. And this is unfortunately very country dependent. And in most of the cases, you have to ask for the permission. So sometimes the permission is just, you know, you know just a formality. You just have to say that you're going to transmit in that band and then you will receive the, 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 the accreditation. And so, but you, 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 you usually have to do that. This is for the commercial deployment. Yeah. If you are testing prototyping, we observe that there are some kind of flexibility. So when you are developing your, your device, when you are developing pilots, where you're developing your prototypes, it's okay, you can transmit on this band. But if you are selling a product and if you are deploying this on a commercial basis, then of course uh, you, need, um, you need to uh, ask for the permission. Yes, okay. uh, just, uh, I don't know if you have uh, time, but can I, can I very quickly share uh, an experience in one of the country, or uh, African country, I will not say the, the name of the country, but for this guy, for uh, one of this country um, today, actually, to yeah. be able to do some, uh, to do some, let's, let's say, work on this field with creating startup and so on, you need to have at least a budget uh, over to 50,000 uh, euros. Okay? Oh, okay. Have the permission. This is, there is some very, uh, very uh, restrictive conditions. Okay? You don't, you don't know. They imposed you to have uh, six employees to have some frequency spectra uh, equipment and some, something like that, which, is, which cost very high. Uh, yeah. But now it's moving to, it's, now there is somehow a, a flexibility with uh, creating some, uh, some special status for, uh, for, for startups. Okay. okay. So today you can have, you can explore, you can do some stuff and so on. Uh, this is one of, of an experience in an African country. In this same time in Europe, it's free. You can use anything. You can use yeah. uh, it's, it's 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 mess, but uh, it's just an experience. Thank you. Definitely. So so I I don't okay, know. If thank you for. Uh, can I can I add time. something? Uh, I, I know that I know that uh, this is not uh, in uh, link to the topic of this uh, meeting, but I think that there is a need of sensitization of a regulator because we as a young people starting business, this this topic I think a regulation issue is very important. So I don't know. Uh, I, I know that it is not the topic of this of this of this uh, training of this uh, session. But I think that it is very important to, to make some lobby or some sensitization to this uh, uh, ministry uh, regulation because uh, we know that uh, IoT will be a, a great opportunity for young people uh, starting business in, in particular in, uh, in smart agriculture. So um, I don't know uh, if you have some experience, uh, if, we, if it is, if there is a need to train the regulator agency or the ministry agency to know the importance of uh, LoRa, or I don't know if ITU, and uh, that is the international organization, has uh, I don't know some some strategies to to help country to to facilitate the implementation of IoT for young people or for or, or for startup or for or for for Beginner. I don't know. Yes, yes. Okay, so let me try very quickly so, so that we can move uh, forward. ITU and, and the general uh, international community are aware of these uh, difficulties and even, even potential, the economic potential, innovation potentials of IoT. So they want to relax a little bit um, their, their regulations. So um, things like this takes time. And, uh, but there is a real awareness in ITU to be able to uh, have some more flexibility regarding the usage of uh, frequencies for IoT. So things are going to change for sure. Uh, the regulators are going to change the rules, okay? Because uh, regulations 
it's true at one time, but if they change the regulation, it means that they change the whole rules. So they can change the whole rules if they want. They just want, but I mean, all these political things takes time, but for sure, I mean, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that things are going to be much simpler because of the huge potential of IoT. There are already discussions within ITU and they have the uh, WRC, the World Radio Conference taking, taking a place every year in Egypt and, and they, they, they're speaking about this. They're speaking on, on frequencies for IoT, they're speaking about uh, frequency for satellites, they're speaking about a lot of things and they are aware of this problem. But again, take, it takes time. But uh, as you said, I mean, some experience show that some countries uh, want to relax the, the constraint on this kind of uh, frequencies just to increase the, uh, uh, the innovation capabilities. Okay, um, so now um, let, let's, try to move, uh, let's try to move forward and, 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 and talk about uh, one, one of the issues uh, is uh, on the uh, IoT hardware. And so, yeah, okay. Um, so IoT device uh, is this is an example of an IoT device. So you usually have a sensors and you put some electronic processing and then you know the radio models it could be lower and so on. So these this part some electronic and processing is represented here, okay. And most of this electronic uh, processing is realized by what, what we call the microprocessor, microcontroller, okay? So you probably know more with the microprocessor world because it's in every computer, okay? The microcontroller is a little bit different. Maybe you, you've heard about it, but you don't know exactly, you, you may not know exactly what's the difference between microprocessor and microcontroller. The, the difference is, this is microprocessor, okay? You have the processing engine and everything else is separated. You have the RAM, the IO port, databases, everything is separated. So you have to provide it separate, okay? And the difference with a microcontroller, everything is on the same chip. So it means that you can buy a microcontroller and then start working with it without worrying about buying extra memory and adding special circuitry for, for communication buses and so on, okay? Everything is embedded. Uh, visually, like, like so visually, on ships? Yeah, we can say that. We can say that the microcontroller is some kind of system on chip. We can say that. Uh, even though the notion of system on chip is a bit larger, but we can we, we can we can say that microcontroller could be some kind of system on chip. Visually, as you as you can see in this slide, nothing uh, show you that this is a microcontroller because it looks like a microprocessor, right? It looks like a usual chip, okay? But it has everything on it. But now, if I say that it it is completely standalone, it means that you can just buy the chip and start working with it. But it's not very easy because the pins here are very small, okay? So the, when you move from microcontroller to what we call microcontroller board, it just because you take the microcontroller, you add some, let's say optional circuitry. It's not, it's not, mandatory microcontroller to run, but it's easier for you because you want to add LED, you want to add a voltage regulator so that you could inject a little bit more than the expected voltage. You have easy access to pin because the pins here are very tiny, here, okay, it's very tiny. But then all these pins are exposed, uh, are exposed to larger pins. So you have better access to pin. You add serial USB interface so you can plug it to a computer much more easily. But remember, if you want to work with a microcontroller itself, it's possible, okay? That's the difference with microprocessor. So most of these uh, low cost general hardware pushed by the Arduino community, you may heard about Arduino. It's, it's an initiative that started in 2006 or 2000, 
seven, I don't, I don't remember exactly. But they propose a whole range of low cost microcontroller board, okay? They're using standalone microcontroller and then they're adding some circuitry to make them easier to use. And there's a lot of them out there. I mean, the ecosystem is very large compared to what happened to, to be there on the market five years ago. And it's still growing. A lot of these microcontroller boards are very powerful. Look at this one. It has an embedded LED screen here. This one is very powerful. This one can run Python language embedded in it. Okay, so a lot of them are very powerful and very smart. And there's one that we, we really like, the Arduino Promini. It's very small. It costs one euro from Chinese manufacturer, and it's very versatile. And we're using it a lot in our IoT device development. And the whole Arduino community managed to uh, empower a whole do-it-yourself communities of makers. And maybe some of you are aware of this, and maybe some of you already are makers themselves, so you probably know about it. So, which Arduino board for IoT? Uh, most of the time, you need an Arduino which size is small, so that you can integrate it into your final product more easily. And, on, and also, the energy consumption is very important. Okay, so Arduino Pro Mini, for, for instance, run in 3.3 volt and 8 megahertz version, which is quite suitable for most of IoT applications. And this is something that we use it a lot. Okay, so you see that it is this microcontroller in the centers and then the microcontroller board, which is very small. This, the, the image here is in scale, okay, the one euro coin. It's approximately in scale with the board. So it costs one euro and it's approximately the size of the one euro coin. So it can be integrated very easily into your final product. So here are some examples of integration of the board into a breadboard for prototyping. But then you could have also you could develop your own PCBs here with the LoRa radio, as you can see here. And you can integrate everything into a box here just by attaching a sensor device. So there's a lot of projects like this if you want to dig into the internet to, to, to see a lot of do-it-yourself products. And there are a lot of them are based on the Arduino Promini because it's very, it's very easy to, it's very easy to use. Sorry, uh, just a question here. Uh, yeah, sure. Can we, can we do a commercial product based on uh, an Arduino for, for instance, it's, uh, or should we use it only for prototyping and then we need to create our uh, own PCB when it comes to, to have a product, uh, commercializable product? Okay. Um, the the answer is uh, it's up to you, but the main is nothing such Arduino Promini to be in a commercial product because it is very reliable. Okay, it's it got one euro, but it can work for years. Okay, the only reason you may want to develop your own PCB and so on. Is because you want to protect your your product to to so that people are not reproducing it too easily. Okay, if 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 mm -hmm. people can use the Arduino Promini, maybe they, they, they can reproduce what you're making. Okay, so that that's that's the main reason a lot of people are developing their own PCB. But actually, they are developing their own PCB to integrate components so that you cannot change the components easily. But if you're using the Arduino Promini like it is, and then connect your radio modules, mm -hmm. it can work for years. Okay, it can work. It's not. It's not going to consume more because you didn't integrate it. Okay, consumptions not depend really on that. So the question is, you can use it in a commercial product, but if you okay. don't want people to. Uh, to, to copy, copy your ID work. too yeah. easily, then at some time you have to switch to some kind of integrated PCBs. Perfect. There is no legal issues or something like that. Okay. Thank no, you so no, 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 not at all. Not at all. No. Okay. Thank you. No legal issues and no performance issues and so on. 
but you should you should uh, sh share your your uh, your code and so on because it's CC like that, right? No, no, no. Uh, okay. You you do you don't need you you share your code because okay. your code is belongs to you. If you if you want to provide it open source, it's okay. But it's not because you're using an Arduino that you have to provide the source. No. It, because they, they sell the Arduino to you. So it belongs to you and then you develop your own code and you can distribute everything without sharing the code. Thank you. Is it clear? Okay. Yes, very clear. Thank you so much. So uh, in, in, in the WASIA project, uh, we also integrated yeah, we integrated it to the WASI dev, but provide some some additional uh, additional features that you, otherwise you have to add it on top of the Arduino. So we, we provide the regulator for batteries, lipo batteries that can be recharged with um, solar panel. We have battery level monitors. We have uh, two high current control pin. We have ground rail because a lot of time when you want to connect sensors, you're missing ground rail. I mean, here here if you look at the Arduino, there's only two ground pin so if you need more ground pin then it's a bit difficult so this is kind of, of thing that we provide but uh, it's, it's not very different from an Arduino Pro Mini okay it has additional features but it's not that different okay so uh, you, you can use it and we use it to build domain specific sensors we use to build a GPS color we use it to to build soil moisture uh, devices like here. We use it for waste bin, proof of concept, weather station, watering and so on. So these are the kind of things that you can build using the, uh, this, this kind of board, using this kind of radio very easily. Okay, now um, I reach to more high level uh, issues of Internet of Things. So, is there any questions regarding what we've seen so far, the wireless and then the hardware issues before I move on? I have a question about um, your experience at Wazi Up. Uh, yeah. Currently, uh, did you have some success, successful, uh, successful uh, experience using? Uh, uh, your device in some countries and currently has been a uh, chance to be scaled up or uh, are they now in uh, in experience uh, status or now we are going to be scaled up yeah there, there has there has been many pilots uh, in um, smart smart agriculture in aquaculture um, these are these are pilots okay uh, because it, it's up to it's up to the entrepreneurs, it's up to the startup to take the technology and, and try to scale up themselves and to try to make a business. We do have some success stories, uh, meaning that they they use at the very beginning of the prototyping phase the wasi of technologies, and then they they, they build the prototyping so they can save like one year of development because they use the code that. Uh, already uh, already uh, debugged and so they can work on top of it and and then at the uh, and then at the once they want to commercialize it then then move to more integration so this is the usual way uh, when you're making to put the product on the market you start with prototyping using the open source things and then you you start to close a little bit the development because you want to make a business of it okay so Real products that are uh, that are under development for commercial usage uh, that have been initially, um, I would say, uh, using was the technology. Yes, okay, uh, but the large scale, but the large scale is, is up to the final entrepreneur. Yeah. Yes, uh, my my last question for this point is: uh, Is it possible to have a uh, no, I don't know, like a platform of sharing sharing experience of uh, of those who uh, those who are we are start, already started the, the prototyping. Is it possible to have a I don't know, like a kind of platform to share the experience and to help uh, our entrepreneur? We want to start the pilot. Is it possible for Wazi Hub to, to? Yes, to I believe this? that on the Wazi Hub uh, web page page mm -hmm. of the project, there are, um, there are a forum or there are discussion uh, forum uh, 
where experience, learn experience are going to be exchanged. Yes, definitely. Okay, so let me let me just okay. uh, verify my, your your answer, please. Yes. Okay. If I understand if I understand well, you say that we can take the prototypes uh, done by Wasiop and then build on top of them a product to be commercialized by by a startup we create, right? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. There is no okay. legal issues or something like that. Yeah, everything is, is open source. So at, okay. at point at 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 a, at a given time, you take uh, you take everything that are open source, and then from that you can develop your own product, and then and then you can sell it. And the the whole the whole idea of the was your was your project is to provide open technology so that you can save time. You don't need to build everything from scratch. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on a little bit on higher level, and these are also related to IoT. And I wanted to uh, to raise awareness of, about the whole IoT ecosystem. So I started with wireless technologies, as, and then I move on quickly to IoT hardware. Now it's more on on the uh, higher level, and the first thing I want you to to talk is how can we find information. Imagine we have millions or billions of IoT devices sending information, okay, lots of information. How are you going to seek for information in that kind of ecosystem? So uh, we as human, we use Google or other search engine, okay? And we use IoT clouds, we use HTTP requests, and then we use in order to be able to seek for information. And this is not very practical for objects because they are not humans, okay? So the goal is completely different. So here I want to, uh, to uh, make you aware of a model where we are going to change from search for information to get information, okay? It's a little bit subtle, okay? The difference is subtle search for information or get the information. What does it mean? It means that if you are interested in some kind of information, then you can subscribe to this information, just like you subscribe to some kind of Twitter channel or news, okay? It's the same, it's the same concept behind this. So if you subscribe to something, then somebody has to publish something, okay? So, Definitely Twitter is nice, uh, uh, nice implementation of what we call the publish subscribe model. So in this model, somebody published something, could be the temperature of room S25, and we have people subscribing to this information. They subscribe, okay, I'm interested in knowing the temperature of room S25. So what happened is when the producer of the information, so typically the temperature sensors capture something, it's going to send it to what we call a broker, okay? And then people will subscribe to this broker. And when they subscribe, they will receive the information. Okay, so this is how we change from search for information to get information. How does it work? It's even work better because now a lot of people have their smartphone. So you can publish and subscribe using your smartphone also. Okay, so you can receive notifications directly on your smartphone. How does it work? Here you have the broker, okay, which are the central repository. So when you publish, you publish to the broker. And when you subscribe, you subscribe to the broker. And the broker is going to make the mapping be between who's publishing and who's subscribing, okay? And what we call the topic before the topic is something very simple. The syntax of the topic is very simple to understand. Here we have UPPA, so my university, slash Dubwe, the name of the building, slash S25, the name of 
the room slash temp to say that it's a temperature in room S25 in the doable building at my university. Okay, so notice the syntax of the topic. So you're going to publish to a topic and you're going to subscribe to a topic. And you can see here how I subscribe to the topic. I subscribe to this topic and then it's going to publish to this topic. Okay, so the whole system is based on the broker here. Okay, the broker will know who is publishing to the topic and who is subscribing to the topic. Now, if you look on the uh, uh, App Store or, or Google Play and you search for MQTT dashboard, because, sorry, I forgot to mention that MQTT is the protocol that implements the publish subscribe model adapted for Internet of Things. Because when we look for MQTT plus smartphone on Google Play or App Store, you see a lot of applications out there. Okay, a lot of them. So you can install them on your smartphone and directly receive notifications from MQTT. And you can also go towards what we call open data because nothing prevents an organization to publish open data. For instance, for instance, my university can publish open data on room A, publishing temperature, humidity, whatever. A city, poor city where I live, can decide to publish weather data, can decide, UPPA, my university can decide to publish information on Congress events and so on. And this open data can really be the added value of the whole IoT ecosystem, okay? Let's suppose for instance that you want to be a smart, agriculture applications. We all know that weather conditions is very important in agriculture, okay? So you're going to install weather station, you're going to install a smart humidity sensors and so on. But at one time, you may be interested in getting the weather from satellite data in order to refine your prediction model. And this is where MQTT can come into play. You can subscribe to channels so that you can integrate data channels into your prediction model, okay? So this is something very important to consider in the IoT ecosystem. And now I just want to mention how important this model is because you may, you, you may use a lot of social media. You may use, for instance, WhatsApp. It's very easy, so easy to build WhatsApp-like application using MQTT. Let me show you an example. You have two persons, the same two students. They both have their smartphone, and these are the smartphone number, the telephone number, okay? You just have to define one MQTT topic per phone number. Alice, this is a topic because it is a number. Bob, this is his topic. If you want these two person to be able to exchange data privately, Alice will subscribe and publish to Bob's topic. And Bob's will subscribe and publish to Alice's topic. So both of them, they can exchange data in a WhatsApp manner. See, see how easy it is to build such chat application using MQTT. Now, if you want to create a group, you have a group owner, Let's assume that Alice create a group, was your IoT. So this is the topic of the group. See that the phone number here is a phone number of Alice, who is the owner of the group. So she's creating was your IoT topic. So she can share this topic to all the person who wants to join the group. Okay. So let's consider what you're doing when you create a WhatsApp group with your friends. You're doing exactly the same. One friend creates a group and then you have the link to this group and then you join the group. And then you just have to subscribe and publish to this topic so that everybody will receive the data from everybody. And then you can have a group 
exchange of these edges. So see how the publish subscribe model is very convenient for Internet of Things, but it's very also convenient for social media. So maybe you don't know it, but you already use MQTT when you're using WhatsApp, when you're using Twitter, when you're using all the tools, because they rely on this kind of protocol in order to make the, the mapping between users and a group, uh, group uh, communications. Okay. Any questions? No? So let's yeah. move on. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry? Yeah? I, I have one question between uh, comparing it between MQTT and HTTP GET POST. Is okay. there a big difference if we're using uh, HTTP? As you said, it's a lot of IoT devices can use it. Um, there are two differences. Uh, the first difference, the big difference, is MQTT rely on a software component in between where we call the broker. Okay. And the broker is in between because it's between the publisher and it's between the subscriber. Okay. Mm. And it's not the same as a web server. Not exactly the same because it has the logic to make the mapping between publish and subscribe pattern, which is not the case with HTTP post or get yeah. or whatever. And then the second difference, and this is why it is more adapted for IoT, is HTTP is a very heavy protocol, text-based protocol. Ah, it's and a heavy protocol. Yeah, it's a heavy protocol. It takes a lot of data to send HTTP requests because behind mm. this, you have TCP, and then it's, I mean, the whole protocol stack is very heavy. So it's not lightweight. MQTT is very lightweight. You, you need a few bytes in the header instead of dozens of bytes. So it's much more, uh, let's say, memory uh, efficient. So yeah. it's lightweight. So this is why it is much more uh, convenient to be implemented on uh, resource constrained uh, devices. And okay. for security and the privacy? Uh, you can have encrypted MQTT, you can have uh, encrypted with password access, so you can have everything oh, oh, uh, yes. that can be. I mean, the, the, uh, the normal, the, the, the most open way to use MQTT is without uh, encryption, but you can do encryption. And, and this is what uh, WhatsApp is doing, for instance. They encrypt it, they're using an encrypted version of, of MQTT. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Okay, please. Okay. Uh, MQTT, it's, a, it's also a TCP IP protocol, right? Uh, it, can use on, uh, it can use on on UDP and not TCP. I mean, you UDP. can have both. Yeah, both. you, can, you, and you can have both. Yeah. So most of the uh, MQTT uh, implementation, they, they can use both protocols. So if you want to use UDP, it's much lightweight. You don't have the yeah. reliability, but then it's okay. Yeah. And CRC, uh, check redundancy, it's not existing UDB, which is more light than TCP. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So if you need re reliability, then you have to implement it yourself with acknowledgement and so on. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, another question. I want to know that with MQ MQTT, uh, what is the, um, the place? It is between um, the protocol is between the device and the gateway, or it is between the gateway and the, the cloud, uh, in which, which, uh, or it is, it is, or it is all in all the uh, the level. I want to know exactly the the place of the, the protocol, where, where the protocol is working, okay, in between between which device or between yes. each. Okay, I see. Um, in 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 the current um, uh, most well-known deployment of IoT. Uh, the gateway, the IoT gateway is usually the central device that connects all the other IoT devices. So MQTT is usually run between the gateway and internet clouds. In some, in some cases, 
you can run QTT directly on the device itself. But then the device needs some kind of internet access. So this is only true if you have Wi-Fi access on the device itself, okay? It's possible, but it's not energy efficient, as I said, because Wi-Fi is not energy efficient. So most of the time, people choose to have LoRa or Sigfox or whatever between the device and the gateway. And then the gateway will have MQTT installed on it. Okay, so this is a usual deployment right now. Does it answer your question? Yes, okay, thank you, it's good. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. So now we know that uh, MQTT uh, is a very well used and very well convenient protocol for IoT. Can we make it simpler? Because uh, even if I believe the ecosystem right now is much simpler than what existed a couple of years ago, still, can we make it simpler? Because end users are not computers, scientists. And there's a lot of graphical tools available. Can we mix IoT with graphical tools? Then some people did this. And there's Node-RED that has been developed by IBM. It's an open source tool. And it's very convenient. It's working on any computers, working on single board computers, like Raspberry or BeagleBone. And you have a graphical interface where you have building blocks, communicating building blocks, processing building blocks, and then you just have to arrange them, create links between them to be able to build very easily IoT workflows, okay? Data of workflows saying that, okay, if I receive something here on my, on my, on, from my device, I'm going to connect to some kind of MQTT broker here. On, I can send it to ThinkSpeak, I, I, Cloud, I can send it to MQTT broker, I can send it to a visual gauge here. So you can build very easily your IoT applications, even if you're not a scientist, because maybe scientists or startups develop the building blocks and then the end user are just going to assemble the building blocks together. So that, that's one technology that you should, you should be aware of because there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Again, my, my, my talk here, really to show you what is the ecosystem because nowadays we cannot afford to reinvent the wheel because we lost time and we lost money to do so. So if you want to go fast, if we want to innovate, we want to use what existing and use it, use it, apply them in a very innovative way. That's the added value that you can bring. The added value is not to reinvent what is existing. Okay, so you, sh you have to consider this kind of applications because it simplifies the of complexity when you want to provide. Okay, uh, let's move on because we can go even a step further, okay, than that because we can add interactions to all these components all together. We know that we have devices. We know that we have social media. We know that we have a lot of applications represented this, uh, I mean, in this slide. Can we link them all together? The answer is yes. A couple of years ago, there's one startup. They had this idea. They call it, if this, then that. What does it mean? It means if I have this, then I should do that, okay? So it's very, very generic. And what they provided is some kind of plugin saying, okay, if I take a picture, then I send it to Dropbox. Or if I receive a mail, then I send it to Twitter. Or if I have a, new picture in my album, then I send it a mail, okay? And you see how generic it is. If this, then that. And then you can decide, sorry, you can decide to link every application to other applications, 
Okay, so this is one way at a very high level to link your IoT events, your IoT data to some kind of actions, okay? So it makes use of the very diverse building blocks that you can find on the internet, okay? And, and if, you want to, to, if you want to create new services, you should also consider, can I implement my services using this kind of platform? Because it can save time, okay? So depends on what you're doing, but this kind of platform can be very relevant to you also. Okay, so just consider it. Okay, um, is there any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah? Are you going to have this recording? Sorry? To, are we going to have this this recording, the recording of the class, because yes, we're having uh, yes, a lot yes. of breaks. Yes, uh, normally we activated the, the recording, so uh, you, you will have access to, to the recording. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any questions regarding the uh, technical issues? Yeah, regarding the presentation. Yes. Okay, so I want to know, um, I think much of it, uh, I thank you so much for the presentation. It was really, really technical and educative. Uh, I want to know specifically, so for those who are just kind of enthused about IoT, maybe from a business point of view, I can assemble a team that will look into all these details. Like, can you share with us some of the devices, uh, what they have has, and the cost of the devices, and then what the devices can do? So we can just sit like from the business development end and try to see what we can do to make more value out of it uh, in certain like industries. So not necessarily like a very detailed technical information but tell us okay this box can take data from a transmitted to b via c these are the possibilities and the cost is this amount uh, is, is that possible yes uh, th there's really a lot of information on the wasi hub uh, project web page where there's pages on technologies there are pages on the packages there are pages on the uh, uh, some kind of uh, a community so uh, there's already that on the web page. So I, I would just send on, on the chat, I mean, the, the, uh, uh, the, the address of the website where you can find all these information. Wow, that would be appreciated. Thank you. OK, no problem. OK, um, I just want to take uh, the, next, um, the next 10 minutes to talk about something that is quite important also. Um, this is what we call the IoT back office. What I call the IoT back office, what it has to deal with. We, we know that there's a lot of buzzword like IoT, big data, AI. Let's try to link all this. IoT means big data because you're going to generate a lot of data, okay? So big data has four properties, volumes, velocity, lots of them, and very fast. Variety, because there's a lot of variety, large variety of sensors or data format. And most importantly, you're not sure about the data. Because he comes with open data, even if it comes with data from your own sensors, but you, you don't know whether the sensors is damaged or not and so on. So the four properties of big yeah, data, no? volume, velocity, variety, veracity, are very important to understand when you want to go into the data processing of IoT data. Now, how to analyze the data? Let me give you an example. What is the meaning of collected data? So let's take the example of uh, a, a farming, farming with cows. One way to get information from the cow is to have some kind of accelerometer neck mounting collar, okay? So these are the raw data, the raw accelerometer data. Now, are you interested really in the accelerometer data? No, what you want is 
to know when is the fertility detection, when is the eating ruminating time, when is the ratio, is my co good, is my co bad, heal, and so on. No. So, what I'm interested in is that. What, can, what can I can have is that, how to detect relevant data. You need advanced data analysis, but as you see in the picture here, the box on advanced data analysis is much smaller from this box. It's done on purpose because no matter how advanced is your data analysis, if you don't have the expert from the domain, you won't be able to say that here, this is the rumination time. Here, this is the activity time. Here, it is something else, okay? So you need to keep that in mind. At the first stage, if you want to make anything valuable from your data, you really need the expert from this domain. And that's true for agriculture, that's true for farming, that's true for a lot of applications. Now, having said that, what are the kind of tools we need for data analysis? Most of them are traditional statistic method. They are still valid and very useful. You don't have to forget them. Regression, uh, statistical predictions, inference, all of them, okay? All of them are very important when we're talking about data analysis. The only thing is, how are you going to do that? Okay, that's the difference. Are you going to be old school using your calculators and all your all, okay, all traditional way of doing statistical. Of course, if I'm asking the question is probably because it's not the right way to do it now, okay? Because we do have a lot of tools available out there on the internet platforms that packages everything for you, machine learning techniques with supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, a lot of them use statistics uh, packages in order to simplify things. A lot of them provide classifications, regression model, and so on, okay? So rather than reinventing the wheels and rather than using it old school, then you can use the power of the internet as well because there's a lot of resources that allows you to run all these tools in parallel with optimized libraries, with web tools to orchestrate, orchestrate various tastes all together and so on. So these things you probably have to dig into this in order to be able to exploit in a more efficient manner the, uh, the smart technologies that are providing data analysis tools. Now, can we go beyond machine learnings? Yes, of course. We, you, most of you probably have, have, have heard about AI, artificial intelligence. And there's a lot of myth behind AI, but there's true things also. And the true things is deep learning based on neural networks model, deep learning neural networks compared to simple neural. As you see, we have a one hidden layer here in simple neural networks, and we have several hidden layers in deep learning neural networks. And the more layer you add, the more parameters or the more dimension you can handle, okay? So a lot of uh, well-known platform like Facebook, Google Photo, Twitter, they do use deep learning a lot when they're going to automatically process videos, photos for you to classify, okay? So you may consider this, uh, this kind of platform also if you want to add some kind of smart data analysis. And again, don't reinvent the wheel. I mean, depends on the programming language you are keen on. 2 be Python, C++, Java, JavaScript, whatever. There's a lot of platforms, there's a lot of packages that already provide all these tools in a very compact and very uh, validated way for you to use them. Okay, so Scikit, Google TensorFlow, Distributed Machine Learning Toolkit, Apache Mashout, and a lot of them exist, okay? So one good thing is you have a large variety of tools to use. The downside is 
there's probably too many of them. So it's very hard to stick with one or maybe the lifetime of a tool is very short because every month there are new tools appearing. So that's the problem with this kind of very emerging technologies, okay? But probably you may heard about Google and TensorFlow and of course it's going to be out there for many years. So it's, it's a nice choice, I mean, to start with and psychic learn also as there for many years. So yeah, if, you, if you program in Python, then it's, it's the key to have. So um, this is the end of, um, of, this, uh, of this course. And um, I, I try to, to, to give an overview of the uh, important issues, or important challenges, important uh, technologies I, I, I see in Internet of Things. And well, hopefully you, you learned something in this um, difficult time of uh, lockdown. And well, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. I have a question uh, regarding the last uh, part of your presentation. That means that if we want to, uh, I, I don't know, we want to specialize or we want to learn more in IoT, that means also we, we need in a parallel to learn about uh, AI, um, ML, uh, all this kind of, uh, of, uh, of um, working with data. That, 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 uh, that I think the goal. Yes. Or you can you can you can uh, have in your team another member that uh, can contribute on this part. You can divide the work on, uh, on for example, collecting data or analyzing data, and uh, each one is uh, responsible of a part. This is my opinion. You don't need to understand everything. Okay, I'm not sure to understand the question exactly. He said that uh, if if you want to do IoT, you need also to to be able to uh, to understand uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence and so on. You need to study these fields also. Well, it, it's not mandatory. Okay, you, you can do very simple IoT uh, by collecting data, building devices that collect data, and then send data to some kind of clouds. And this can be the very basic IoT, but still that can be very innovative uh, in some area in Africa also. So it doesn't mean that it's simple, that it's not innovative and there's not a market for it. Uh, but of course, if you want to provide added value, uh, a lot of them take the, uh, take the approach of using data analysis tool in order to take value out of the out of the data in order to propose prediction models, okay? So of course, if you do that, you have to dig into uh, the, the last part of my talk regarding the machine learning. I mean, it, it can be machine learning, but it can be very simple or, I mean, simple, not that simple, but a very well-known decision support system with rule-based system. I mean, anything, that is adapted yes. to process your data. You don't have to, to run or to dig into AI if it's not suitable. If you don't need AI, then there's no need to, to use it. I think that it's a buzzword, but we have to step back and see whether we really need AI technologies or not. Many applications don't need AI, right? and some other cannot be solved without AI techniques. So we just have to, to know whether the application that you are trying to build can be uh, can satisfy with simple statistical method or it needs AI processing, that's all. My last question, uh, sorry, my last question is based on, ex on your experience, uh, what is, what is the, the important thing we have to take uh, consideration if we want to, if we want to success IoT project in Africa, I can say, uh, most of like, uh, I can say even it is uh, sub-Saharan uh, countries and you're based on your experience. Okay, uh, what, what I see is um, there's a lot of needs, okay, for even sometimes very simple applications. Uh, one of the most crucial is uh, the business model. Definitely. 
uh, and unfortunately, that the that the point of a lot of a uh, lot of uh, advanced projects. And I'm I, I'm not going to say anything new when I say that the business model is is very crucial because you have to to know whether your customer is going to buy your product or not. And if they're going to buy it, it means that they can afford it or they can consider that the advantages of the product is worth the price. So of course, in Africa, we know that the level of living is lower. So it means that you have to propose products that have lower price. Yes. So you have to, to, to find a way to make it lower cost, okay? So probably using uh, local, uh, local resources, local hardware. So uh, we have been doing a lot in low cost adaptation. So if you want to launch something on the African market, definitely uh, you have to consider how to have a low cost version of your, of your solution. You, uh, it's, I mean, I think that I, I cannot say anything new because all these things are well known from, from business people and, and, and they are well known for years that uh, succeeding in, in, in creating something in Africa, you have to take a lot of things uh, from the local economic context. So this is what I can say from my little experience of, uh, uh, of uh, what's the up and what's the up. Uh, so I have a question. Yeah? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, can you hear you? Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, I, wanted, oh, oh, yeah. I wanted to ask, what's the architecture that, that this development board uses? And secondly, does the development board have multi-threading support? Can you repeat your first question, please? What is the architecture that the board uses? Is it an ARM chip? Uh, mm -hmm. And what specifically? Is it a Cortex M4? M7? Okay. Okay, I'm going to answer it um, because I do have this slide here. Okay, so um, the board is, is uh, as I said, is uh, like an Arduino Pro Mini. Okay, so it has a very simple microcontroller at Mega 328P. Uh, as I said, I mean, the added value is that you have an integrated antenna here. So you don't need to, you can put it in a box and use integrated antenna. And then you have regulators built in. So you don't have to buy or to add circuitry to manage solar panels, to manage remote battery level monitors and to, to control uh, high current devices such as GPS for instance. So all these are, are put all together so that you can, um, so that you can um, better deploy your first IoT prototype. Uh, now, what was your second question? My second question, and I'm guessing you've answered it. I wanted to ask if it has multi-threading support, but I, I don't think that make the, no, no, this no, it has no multi-threading support, no, no, no. Um, it, it, it's not like a, like a ESP32 based microprocessor based on ARM um, um, embed. Based on ARM Cortex. Uh, M0 or M3 uh, architectures. No, uh, it's not because it's very low cost, okay? Oh, okay. Um, th th there's some, there some boards that cost like 10 euros to 15 euros that do have some more advanced uh, microcontroller, okay? But uh, okay. remember that the more advanced microcontroller consume more. Okay. Yes. So it depends on your application. If you really need high power, if you really need multi-threading and so on, then okay, maybe you have to consider having solar panels and so on. But if you don't need, okay. if you have a very simple uh, IoT devices, we found that 80% of the IoT applications are working with remote sensing and using simple microcontroller to that. Okay. Also, they, they will probably move their compute to the, to the cloud. And, yeah. Um, 
not necessarily. I mean, there can have there can be some very innovative applications uh, trying to to make a lot of uh, computation on the device itself, or maybe at the gateway level also. So I won't okay. say that moving everything into cloud um, is a general or it's a general solutions. It really depends on the applications. It really depends whether you have stable internet connectivity. Uh, I mean, you, you can certainly uh, uh, you can certainly build a very innovative uh, product by pushing in front of uh, the the advantages that it's doing a lot of local processing because it saves time. So it's not a binary answer, actually. Okay, and I have uh, an another question, if you don't yeah, mind. Sure. Uh, I wanted. I was wondering, how do large companies uh, flash those uh, programs uh, onto their boards at scale? You know, uh, how how is it okay. possible? And, and 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 the last question: Are there any challenges with regards to supply chain for for these boards? It's my last question. Okay. Um, okay. So let me answer the second question first. Then. Okay. Is there any challenges for the supply chain? I don't think so. I think that, I mean, the, the board that you see here, the Wazidev has been manufactured in Kenya, in Africa. And there are probably okay. also countries that are capable of doing that. Uh, because a lot, lot of the uh, steps of the production are completely automatized. They, they have uh, machines that uh, can do that on their own. So I don't see any challenges in, in supply chain, but it's still somehow challenges or you have to find the right manufacturer in Africa to do this. And maybe you do have some logistic in, sh okay. in shipping, okay? Mm -hmm. But this is tractable. Yeah. yeah, this is tractable because we, we did that and, and things are improving a lot. <coughs> now, how, how do large companies flash these kind of devices? The manufacturer usually That's do good. that at, at, at manufacturing time. In, in their production line, they have an option where they can flash the microcontroller with your own code, the code that you want to provide to them. So you provide the binary and at the end of the line, they flash the, the, the devices. So this is how you can, you can build devices on a large scale that can be pre-flashed with some kind of uh, program installed on it. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, professor, uh, I have one question. Uh, yes. Dayan from Serbia. Okay. Uh, was it David looks according to the technical specification quite okay? But my question is are this board going to be released as open source and how we can buy a board? Okay, um, I don't have the answer right now because uh, it is still in discussion. And uh, probably we are going to 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 set this on on the web on the web page uh, when, the when web. yeah when we will have a discussion. Uh, we are we are trying to find how we can distribute it, how how we can sell it. Right now, all the boards are provided to provided to collaborators, people who work with partners in, in innovation processes. We don't have a, a plan yet for commercializing it. Uh, so maybe we will have a plan in the future, but right now we don't. Yeah. Sorry about this. Hello, okay, okay. Uh, the, the question is because the, uh, the, some other boards, they are already released yeah. to release the uh -huh. This one in the future, probably or you're going to release. Okay, thank you very much. Hello. Can you can you, can you unmute, please? Can you mute? Is it a question, or I mean, people who doesn't have question just can you mute? Dejan, please unmute. Is there any questions? Any questions or we can, okay. we can end up the...
Hello. Okay. Sorry, professor. Hello. Hello. Professor, will you do another meet uh, trainings on yeah. another subject with more details, or with... will we have another trainings in the future? With what? Will we have another trainings? In the um, there's, a training. there's a training tomorrow on uh, how to develop mobile web applications. So link it with this uh, webinar. So uh, it's scheduled uh, tomorrow. You should have received uh, a yes, mail. Yes, yes. Yeah. So this is the, uh, this is the, the training. Uh, that okay. The we second will... webinar organized by Wazihub during uh, you... the down uh, period. Excellent. Thank you so much, Professor. Okay, so I think that we can uh, end up the, uh, the webinar if uh, there's no, no more questions. And um, I hope, every I hope uh, to all of you um, to stay safe and uh, hopefully that uh, you learned something during this webinar and uh, well. For sure. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank, you so, thank much. you so much. So we, we, we will have a link of a presentation, the link. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks.